If you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. This time of year, we are accustomed to gift giving. It's customary for individuals to buy gifts, to give gifts, to receive gifts. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. <coughs> it's one of the good things about this time of year, the enjoyment that comes from that. We read in Ephesians chapter 2 of the greatest gift of all, salvation, the gift of God. Most people in the religious world will accept the fact that salvation is truly a gift from God. That it is not something that we earn, it's not something that we deserve that it is a, a true gift. But they fail to harmonize this fact with the rest of God's teachings about the gift of salvation. And there are many ways in which we can look at gift giving today as analogous to God's gift of salvation. And that's what I want to do this morning. First, let us read the first 13 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says, You, he hath quickened. The, the you here is those who have been added to the Lord's body. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Those who are Christians. Those who have left the world. Those who have obeyed the gospel. Those who were once dead in their sins, but now alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sin wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or behavior in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened or made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God." Not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision, or the Jew in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being alien from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We make a few points before we get into the gist of our lesson. And that is the mistake that many in the religious world make about this gift of God. That this gift of God is one that is by grace only. Verse 5 says, Indeed, grace was necessary for this gift to be offered. By grace are you saved. But it also says that faith was necessary for salvation. Verse 8 as well. By grace are you saved through faith. Another misconception regarding this gift is a misunderstanding of the phrase not of yourselves. Many in the religious world say, well, there's nothing whatsoever you can do in order to supply yourself with salvation. This verse doesn't teach that. Verse 9, they continue, not of works lest any man should boast. The works here being mentioned are those works that God has already done. 
There's nothing a man can do in order to be saved separate and apart from anything God has done. That's the point. If a man were to come up with a plan of salvation, and they do, that's the reason there's so much chaos in the religious world today. There's God's way of doing things, and then there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men deciding for themselves what should be done in order to be saved. And that's what's being condemned here. The not of yourselves is that a man doesn't have the right to determine for himself how he will be saved. It is the gift of God. And that leads us to our first point. As it is analogous to gift giving today, gifts require a giver and a receiver. And both have a role. Okay? When man disrespects the role, it changes and messes up the whole thing. We see that in, the, in our society in many different ways. In the home. The role of the man and the woman in the home is being uh, destroyed by those in the world and by those in society. They don't like how God set up the home. And of course, God is the author of the home just as God is the author of the church. And if you change the way the church does things, it's no longer God's church. And if you change the way God set up the home, it's no longer the home. What people refer to as a home today is not, nothing shy of fornication and adultery. It's not a home as God would define a home. And the reason is because people don't respect God's determining of roles. We recognize in, in just giving of gifts, there's a giver and a, and a receiver. <laughs> we recognize that. It's very simple to get. The giver determines the gift, right? <laughs> the, the giver determines the gift. Now the giver today might ask, what would you like to have? Or, or something of that nature. But the giver determines the gift. The giver determines how much to pay for the gift. The giver decides how to wrap the gift. The giver decides how to deliver the gift. The giver even has the right to choose when to give the gift, you see. Now the problem is, in regards to the gift of God, this receiver wants to tell the giver all of the things he needs to do. When to give the gift, how to give the gift, by what means to give the gift. The receiver has only one role. He can receive the gift or deny the gift. That's his only role. <laughs> right? If someone gives you a gift, you either accept it or you or you reject it. Right? We don't we don't tell people you're going to give me a gift, you're going to give it to me at this time. That's not how gift giving works, right? Not true gift giving. Many people want everything they want. And they want it on their terms. Right? They treat gifts, and this is a problem too. They don't, they don't understand the nature of a gift. Why do people misunderstand the gift of God? Because they don't understand gifts. Many people today treat gifts like it's something they're entitled to. Like something that they were supposed to get. And you better get it right. It's not something that's freely chosen or freely given. It is to be freely accepted. It's something that they wanted and it's something you better get. <laughs> generations of today need to be reminded of yesterday's generations who had nothing, basically. Who may have got a, a piece of fruit for Christmas and just loved it. Perhaps you saw... The uh, I guess it was on YouTube is a big sensation. Some kid got a video game for Christmas, and it, it was 2K15 instead of 2K16. So it wasn't the newest version of the game, and the kid pitched a fit, unwrapped this gift, and pitched a fit over it because it was not the newest version. Almost came to the point of cussing. I don't know how old he was. He was probably 10 years old, almost to the point of cussing. 
And the parent put it on YouTube and thought it was cute. It's sickening. That kid might have had all his gifts taken away from him and I would have had that money back in my pocket. Huh. Okay. You know, they, they don't understand what a gift is. They don't, they don't understand the gift. We many times say it's the thought that counts. Well, it ought to. That ought to be the case, shouldn't it? It ought to be the thought that counts. This kid, uh, obviously, the, the thought didn't matter. <laughs> he didn't get what he wanted. He didn't, get what, he didn't get it when he wanted. He got something he didn't deserve. He got something he didn't uh, earn, right? But he didn't want it. He didn't like it. Not a few people have, and there might be some here today, <laughs> you might have received a gift that you looked at and thought, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do with this thing. Right? You probably have a gift. You might still have it. <laughs> but you smiled and you said, you know, I appreciate you thinking about me. You, you thought about me when you were shopping and you got this for me. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9, the Bible tells us that there is distinction between the giver and the receiver. God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, when we were dead in our sins, He quickened us together with Christ and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved, verse 8, and that not of yourself is it, it is the gift of God. The Bible is very clear here on the distinction between the giver and the receiver. Nowhere in this passage does it said, say that the receiver made any recommendations on how the gift was to be given, when to be given, how to be given, right? Because that wasn't the role of the receiver. The receiver can either accept the gift or deny the gift. Secondly, as it applies or is analogous to gift giving today, gifts are not free. Gifts are not free. You receiving the gift may not have to pay something for the gift and may consider it to be free. But it was paid for. Somebody paid for that gift. <coughs> There was a cost with that gift. We talked about uh, the price and the cost this morning in our Bible class. The gift itself is not free. It has a price. It has a cost. But there's also a cost in regards to the reception of the gift. Or there might be. David this morning in our Bible study understood that he was not going to give a <coughs> sacrifice to God that cost him nothing. Right? He was going to be given something free, right? Forgiveness. But he had to build an altar. And instead of having everything supplied for him, he was going to pay the price for the altar and all the things that went along with the sacrifice. And his reasoning was, I will not give to God that which cost me nothing. Today, religious people want God to give them everything and it cost us nothing. And because they don't appreciate the role of the giver and the receiver, they don't make the analogy that gifts are not free. Salvation required a high price, right? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Paul told the church at Ephesus, the elders there, take heed therefore to yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. That's a very high price, right? The sacrifice of a sinless lamb, the sinless Son of God. And you know that there was only one who had the means to pay that price? There was only one individual, there was only one who had the resources to pay the price for sin. He's rich in mercy, Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy, right? How could God uh, give us this gift? How could He offer this gift? Because He's rich in mercy. 
He's rich in love. Chapter 2, verse 4. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that He gave His only begotten Son. He's rich in grace and in kindness. Ephesians 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, the Bible says, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, <laughs> one individual once said, what's the therefore, therefore? It means that you were bought with a price. You've been purchased, right? The price has been paid. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now that you've been purchased, and this uh, applies individually, and each individual, as we make up the church, it responds to collectively. Each individual Christian has been purchased by the blood of Christ, and the church collectively, each individual together, the church is the blood-bought institution of God. And what are we to do? We're to glorify God. That's what we're to do. Many want to receive a gift, and then curse God, basically, with how they live. They may not do it with their mouth. But the way they live, they deny God in everything they do. And then they say that they are recipients of a free gift of salvation. No, the Bible says you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Colossians 3, verse 17, whatsoever you... Uh, what all you do, do all in the name of the Lord, whether in word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord. Do it by His authority. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. Gifts are not free. Someone had to pay for it and they are not free of conditions upon receipt. Notice chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past, now here's the key, in time past you walked how? According to the course of this world. That's it. Like everybody else. Worldly people. Later in this passage it says by nature. That's what had become natural to everybody. What was natural to everybody, it wasn't how they were born. They weren't born that way. It had become natural because everybody was doing the same thing and they were all wicked. Verse 3, Among whom also we all had our behavior in time past and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, here it is, the children of wrath, even as others, that it had just become commonplace. But, verse 4, now here's the contrast, right? The word but says there's a contrast. You one time lived and walked according to the world, according to the lust of the flesh, according to fulfilling of the desires of your own flesh and mind. But now, after you've received the gift, how do you walk? Do you walk the same way or is there a, a change? Drop down to verse 10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There's a change in there. There's walking according to the ways of the world before we receive the gift. Then after we receive the gift, we're walking in accordance with good works. God's good works. <coughs> Notice the difference in the word works there. There's two works here being mentioned. Verse 8 and 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the works of man devised in the mind of man. Verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works ordained by who? Which God hath ordained. See, there's a difference. Man's way of doing things and God's way of doing things. Don't do things your way. Do things God's way. That doesn't mean that there's no work to be done. It just means don't do the works of man. Do the works of God. In Luke chapter 14, verse 
verse 27. Jesus said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, we'll never have to carry a cross like Jesus had to bear. But the cross here is representative of a burden. Responsibility. Work, right? We do have a cross to bear once we are given the gift of God. That's what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. And then he explains, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counts the cost? There's a cost to being a disciple of Christ. There's a cost to receiving this free gift. Huh? It's simple. It's reasonable. It's not an overly burdened price, is it? Jesus said, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Right? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. James 2 verse 17 says, Faith if it has not works. Same kind of works that we're referring to in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. The works of God. Works that God commands. If it doesn't have works of obedience, it's dead. Being alone. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Jesus told the Audience, if you accept you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. Repentance, a condition of this gift of salvation. And of course, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The gift of God, the gift of salvation offered. The ability to have one's sins forgiven, remitted, as if they had never uh, taken place, but preceded by condition, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Free gift, but conditional. It's conditional upon our hearing. It's conditioned upon our adding to our faith. It's conditioned uh, upon whether we're willing to change from walking in the world and repent and walk according to God's ways. And it's conditional as to whether we will be baptized in order to be buried with Christ. Why wouldn't we want to be buried with Christ? Individuals say, well, I don't want to be baptized because it's work. It's work. I don't, want, I don't want to do any works. Because God says it's not of works. And you go to Romans chapter 6 and you say, do you not want to be buried with Christ? Do you not want to be raised up together with Him? <laughs> do you not want to be buried in the likeness of the Lord? Do you not want to be in Him? <laughs> because that's the only way an individual can be in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The only act, the only work, the only means of getting into Christ as presented in the New Testament is for one to be immersed into Christ. That's the only way. You can't be in Christ if you have not been baptized. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, we will remember without ceasing your work of faith. I don't want to work. I don't want to do any work because that would mean that I don't trust God. Do you believe in God? Yes. Well, God says that's a work. <laughs> it is a work. It's an obedient act. Do you believe? Yes. Well, that's obedience. And it's not the only act of obedience that we're required to do. Is it? We're not saved by faith only of uh, James chapter 2, verse 17, but it's an act. He continues, your work of faith, your labor of love. Do you know love is a work? God knows love is a work. For God so loved the world that He stopped. No, He gave. He gave His only begotten Son. <laughs> Gifts are not free. We understand that principle in our gift giving today. Why don't we understand that in regards to God's gift of salvation? We also note that some gifts are not appreciated some people receive gifts and don't appreciate them. I suppose you could put that kid in this category too, right? He didn't appreciate the gift he got. In verse 11 through verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, Wherefore remember that you being in time past, here's how you were, Gentiles in the flesh, 
who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ, you're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now how could anybody not appreciate having had their sins washed away by the blood of Christ through obedience to the gospel? <clears throat> but some, some gifts are not appreciated. No matter how much something costs, if the receiver is not interested in the gift or is not interested in doing what is necessary to receive the gift or receives the gift and then takes that gift for granted, the gift is of no value, is it? It doesn't do him any good. You know, an individual could actually receive the gift of salvation and if he take it for granted, it does him no good. He's lost. If he says, I'm not willing to do what's necessary to receive the gift, then he's lost. It does him no good. It doesn't matter if it's free or not. <clears throat> <clears throat> You'll remember Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. In fact, let's just turn to that. Example. Second Kings chapter 5. And we'll just read verse 10 uh, where Elisha says to Naaman, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. This is what he wanted. He wanted to be clean. That's why he went to Elisha in the first place, right? And Elisha said, Go and be clean. Right? Well, he had to dip seven times in the Jordan River, right? There was a condition to his being clean. And it's not burdensome, right? It wasn't a burden. It was simple. It was reasonable. But Naaman, in verse 11, was wrong. He didn't appreciate the gift. He had the opportunity to be clean of his leprosy, but he didn't appreciate it. He was wrong. He went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. And there are many reasons as to uh, why perhaps he felt this way or thought this way. Fortunately for him, some of his servants uh, instructed him a little better and brought him back to himself. In verse 14, he went down, dipped seven times in the Jordan and was clean. Right? Just because he did what God said to do. But you know, Naaman had the gift. But if he doesn't dip seven times in the Jordan, he doesn't benefit from it. He took it for granted, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 through verse 30 in particular, the parable of the talents. The Bible tells us that there's a man with one talent. And he goes and he hides it into the ground, right? Right? Did he appreciate that gift? I, you know, if you appreciate something, you don't go hide it in the dirt. <laughs> right? When the Lord of that money came back, He said the, 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 the smallest amount you could have done was at least take it to the bank and get some interest on it. Right? But you hid it in the dirt. The servant tries to wiggle out of it and says, well, I heard you was a hard man. I didn't know. Well, that was false, wasn't it? The Lord wasn't a hard man. And if he was a hard man, he really believed that, why didn't he go earn twice the amount, right? Why did he go hide it? He didn't appreciate what he had. And he lost it in this parable. He was given a talent. He lost it because he didn't use it. In John chapter 6, verse 60, Jesus is teaching and his disciples hear him. And the Bible says the disciples heard it and it was a hard saying. And Jesus uh, says, because he knew their hearts, some of them don't believe. Now they believed to a point, didn't they? They were right there in front of him. They saw him. <laughs> they saw him. They believed that he was Jesus. What's it mean to believe? They weren't faithful to him. He knew they weren't faithful to him. Their allegiance was wavering. 
Why they were following Jesus at this time, we don't know. But they were only there in the flesh, weren't they? In mind, they were somewhere else. God said that you, you don't believe. And the proof of that is because when Jesus pointed that out to them, the Bible says they walked no more with Him. They went away. Now some in the religious world say, well, they were never with the Lord in the beginning. It's a circular reason. They're not saved because they were never saved to begin with. No, they were saved. They were followers of Christ. The Bible said they were disciples. <laughs> and they left Him. So they were once saved and now lost. Okay, That's what the Bible says. They didn't appreciate what they had, did they? They had the gift. And for some reason, whatever it was, maybe different reasons for all of them, they stopped following Jesus and walked no more with Him. Some gifts are not appreciated. And the gift of God is not appreciated today either. That's the reason people look at it flippantly. That's the reason uh, church buildings are full two times a year and, and maybe empty the rest of the year. They don't appreciate the gift. And lastly, as it is analogous to gift giving today, some gifts go unclaimed. <clears throat> I heard a report, and I think this is accurate, over a, over a billion dollars worth of gift cards go unused. Now that might be like partial pieces of a gift card. So like if you get a $25 gift card and you have $7 left on it, well, if you have seven and a hundred thousand other people have seven dollars and they put that in the drawer and never use it, you know, on the back of those gift cards it says, treat this like money. But you know what? People look at it and they say, that's a card. If you looked at it like money, you'd spend it, right? Because you know you're going to lose it. That's the only way you can use it is to spend it. But eventually, after time, people go, well, you know, this is in the way and... You know, I got a pile of these and they put it in a drawer and some and they may even throw them away. It wouldn't shock me if there's hundreds of thousands of dollars in the in the in the dump worth of worth of these gift cards. They had a free gift in their hand, right? And what did they do with it? It went unclaimed. It was free. Did they get anything out of it? No, they left it. Or they lost it. Or they threw it away. April and I, we unclaim gifts all the time. About once a month, we get a call. We win a cruise about once a month. We win a cruise. I don't know if you all win cruises every month or not. We're very lucky people. You wouldn't believe how lucky we are. We win a cruise. I hang up on them. You know why? Because I am not willing to go through the conditions to claim the gift. Now, that's my right. I get to say, that, well, they said they're going to give it to me. It's a free gift. But I recognize there's conditions that go with it and I don't want to do it. And so guess what? I don't get the cruise. Now I get that. And the, and the world gets that. Even non-religious peoples understand I've got a cruise, I can take it if I fulfill these conditions. And, and most everybody hangs up. right? Somebody doesn't because they keep calling which means it's working somewhere. But everybody recognizes that there's conditions to getting that free gift and we all voluntarily choose to not do the condition. They don't claim the gift. How many people don't claim the gift of God because of the conditions? They don't like the conditions. I don't, want, I don't like the conditions, so I don't claim my gift. The gift of God is open and offered to all men and all men don't accept the gift. We know that because God said... Many are called and few are chosen. Why are few chosen? Because only few accept the gift. In Acts chapter 26, verse 28, perhaps the most well-known, most popular example of an unclaimed gift is King Agrippa, right? Paul said, I know you believe You've seen the facts. And Agrippa said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. 
He could have said it like this. Almost you persuade me to accept my free gift. But he, uh, he chose not to accept the gift. Right? The giver offered the gift and the receiver denied it. And that's their right. They have the right to reject the gift. <clears throat> so I think, and these are just a few examples, but I think this analogy can help us understand the true meaning of the gift of God. When we look at what it means to give gifts of value today and how valuable the gift of God truly is and what the gift of God is. When we recognize the distinctive role between the giver and the receiver and we understand that the gift is not free, when we recognize that there is a need for appreciating <clears throat> the gift, claiming the gift, so as to benefit from the gift, it should help us see what it means for salvation to be a gift from God. Sadly, those in the world who say they have the gift of God do not. And it was probably because one of the reasons that we've mentioned here. They either didn't claim the gift, they didn't appreciate the gift, or they've lost the gift. They didn't, they didn't, take, they didn't appreciate it. <clears throat> when we look at the price that Jesus paid, the small price we pay to receive a gift is nothing. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it's your reasonable service. Your logical service. It's logical to be thankful for the gift. It, and how do we show our thanks to God but to say, we love you. And how do we love God but to do what He says to do? If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. John 14, verse 15. The gift is offered if you've not yet received the gift. The invitation is open. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. If you believe to the point of repenting of your past sins, confessing that Jesus is the source of salvation, being immersed in water to have your past sins washed away, to be added to the Lord's church by God Himself, you'll be freed from the past of your sins, you'll be freed from the guilt of that sin, you'll be freed from the consequence of that sin, and you'll be a new creature in Christ. And if you'll remain faithful to Christ, one day Jesus will come back and take us home to be with Him in eternity. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have some other need, if you've allowed something to separate you from God, if you've taken your gift for granted or not appreciated the gift or perhaps lost the gift, we're here to assist you in any way we can. Whatever your need is, take care of it now as we stand and sing.